Welcome to To The Point. The state of Michigan has pledged millions of dollars to secure a battery plant near Big Rapids. The promise of jobs and promoting electric vehicle expansion are two driving factors. There is, however, considerable local pushback, and many of the concerns center around who is behind that plant. Second District Congressman John Molinar talked with me about his reservations about this plant and his recent appointment to a committee to look into activities of the Chinese government here and abroad. Congressman, I want to talk to you about something that has gained a lot of attention over the past few months, but in the past few days, it has really started to bubble up. And that's about a battery plant in Big Rapids in your district. And it is a battery plant that the state has been very invested in. And some of the township and county folks in that area have been invested in, but also one that's brought a lot of pushback from some of the residents there. And part of the reason is that the parent company, I mean, the company Goshen, if I understand it, is headquartered in California, but the parent company is from China. And that creates some concerns for some people. There are some environmental concerns. Tell me about your take on this. Sure. Well, one of the contributing factors is that there are a lot of non-disclosure agreements signed. And so it's been very difficult for residents to get accurate information about the project. And that's from state officials and others. Um, secondly, the Goshen High Tech is, is the parent company for Goshen Inc. And uh, right in the Articles of Association, it talks about loyalty to the Communist Party and setting up a party organization and carrying out the activities and the duties of the party according to the Chinese Communist Party. So that is a legitimate concern, especially when you consider it's under 100 miles from Camp Grayling, where according to the Wall Street Journal, we're actually training Taiwanese military leaders for a potential invasion by mainland China. So. There are a host of concerns, but the Chinese Communist Party connection is, is probably looms the largest. How do you quantify that? You talked about the, the non-disclosure agreements, but um, we have foreign comp companies doing business in the United States all over. Um, how, how do you quantify the concerns because this happens to be a Chinese company? Well, I think when you look at our strategy with respect to China, the last few decades has been constructive engagement. The idea that if we do business with them, we'll influence them, they'll become more like us, more freedom loving, both for human rights, property rights. What we've seen is just the opposite. With Xi Jinping, he's put himself in charge of the military civil fusion, which basically says any private sector business has an accountability and responsibility to the military and the Chinese Communist Party. And so it's really gone the other direction in terms of human rights, uh, suppression of dissent. And so the question then is, how much more do we want to be relying on the Chinese Communist Party as, as a possible partner in any venture? Is this the beginning of, for lack of a, a, a better term, a cold war with China when it comes to business and industry? even though as we sit here right now, it appears that this battery plant is largely on the way to becoming reality in, uh, unless something happens at the local level, right? Well, there are multiple uh, levels of you know, approval. So there's a township board that has to rezone the property. It's beautiful agriculture property uh, right across the street from uh, Majestic Frisians uh, horse ranch. Um, there are also uh, different environmental permits that need to be granted. I've also requested a CFIUS review, which is the Committee on Foreign Investment in the U.S. that's purpose is to really vet foreign investments and see if there are any concerns. So there are multiple levels of approval that still need to take place. This plant, according to those who support it, would bring in some really well-paying jobs in an area that uh, I would suggest could use some well-paying jobs. Um, it, is the financial consideration something um, that you have to weigh in, you know, against any of your concerns? Well, I think when you consider the level of state subsidy for this project, 
you know, 175 million in a direct subsidy, but also additional uh, subsidies and credits. Uh, you know, the jobs aspect, you know, when you consider some of the lower income areas of Northern Michigan, that is appealing. But the question is, who do we partner with for jobs? And what is the, the sustainability of those jobs? You know, we already know that the Chinese Communist Party can't be tr trusted. You know, they said the balloon that flew overhead was a weather balloon that didn't have navigational devices. We find out that it, it was transmitting very secret information uh, and did have uh, devices. They've set up uh, police stations which spy on and try and intimidate and harass the Chinese diaspora. So the question is, who do we want to partner with and what degree do we want to partner with the Chinese Communist Party? I want to shift gears, but only slightly, and this goes to a committee assignment uh, that you received not too long ago when a new committee was formed to really take a look at the Chinese Communist Party, uh, the China Committee, if you will. You're part of that. Tell me about that committee and what you're focusing on and what, if anything, you've learned that surprised you. Well, we're focusing on the long-term relationship with China. You know, as I mentioned, for the past few decades, we've engaged. Uh, China has become more autocratic, less freedom-loving. Um, and because they've built up their military to such an extent, as well as economically being involved all over the world, uh, there needs to be a new relationship there. They are no longer a third world nation. They are a military and economic power. And so what should our policies be relative to China and the Chinese Communist Party? So that's the purpose of the committee to look longer term. It's a select committee, so it's for a period of time, but we're looking at issues of uh, business, uh, military, human rights, all of the above. Military is one that I think concerns people greatly because we know that China has shown a considerable buildup around Taiwan and that we as a country have said, as you pointed out, we're training Taiwanese soldiers. Um, if there is some type of aggression on the part of the Chinese government against Taiwan, what is the United States prepared to do? Well, first, you mentioned the Cold War. I do believe we are in a Cold War with China and we don't want it to become a hot war. So the best strategy there is to help Taiwan defend itself and become so strong militarily that it's unattractive for China to invade. I think that's point number one. And our goal as a committee to, is to promote freedom, stability, and, uh, and not encourage that to happen. But in the event that that were to happen, you know, Taiwan in one semiconductor plant makes about 90% of the world's high-end, high-tech semiconductor chips. And so when you realize the dependence of the world on this technology, um, the idea that China would try and, and take that over is a huge concern. Not to mention the fact that Taiwan is a democratically elected leadership. They've been a, a valuable ally and partner with the United States. We do a lot of trade. But China has said basically they don't recognize Taiwan. They s support a one China policy by force if necessary. So that does raise significant concerns. Well, I, I don't want to get too far down this path, but I mean, we, we've been dealing with Ukraine for over a year. Uh, we know that we have sent limited resources. I mean, kind of within the scope of, of what the administration believes is appropriate. You've got China, uh, uh, I don't want to say threatening, but at least with a presence around Taiwan. Um, at, at what point do we as a nation get more fully engaged or involved, or, or do we simply kind of do a hands-off strategy and try to support these nations that are defending themselves against a larger um, better equipped um, nation that, that wants to take over their borders and make them part of their country? Well, it's a great question. And again, on the front end, Taiwan has purchased military weapons from the United States. We've been slow in getting them to them. If we learned anything from Ukraine, the idea that they're waiting on weapons that they've already purchased and we are to supply uh, 
only tempts aggressor nations if we aren't delivering on what we said we would do. So I think that's an important consideration and we ought to move that along as quickly as possible. Is there, uh, is there a path to diplomacy? I mean, I've been at this table and the table I used before and, and the one before that and have talked to Republicans and Democrats about China and uh, manipulating currency as they have done um, for decades. And I think that they have been engaged on it by a number of different presidents, again, Republicans and Democrats, and nothing changes. Is there a diplomatic solution when dealing with China, or are, are we, uh, as I suggested and you talked about, in the, the throes of a Cold War that really doesn't allow for conversation? Well, President Reagan talked about peace through strength and trust, but verify. And I think we are in that position where we need to be strong, we need to support our allies, we need to prepare uh, for a very aggressive adversary, both militarily, economically, but we always want to promote peace and, and discussion and relationship. I will say that even our military leaders have been trying to reach out to the Chinese military leaders without much response. And when the spy balloon came over, they would not talk about it. They've stonewalled and not been transparent about COVID origins. They continue to make precursors to fentanyl, which comes across our southern border and deny doing that, even though they have a surveillance state and know everything going on. So uh, can they be trusted? Uh, you know, I'm skeptical, but we always want to be open to promoting peace. But I think it's peace through strength. What is the prospect, and this may be an unfair question to ask of one of 435 members, but I, I guess one of the, the concerning items that surrounds this is that we actually get into some type of a conflict with China. And I mean, having seen our military activities in the past and knowing how the kind of strain that puts on the American psyche, something with China would be something like we have never, ever right. seen. Um, what are we doing to avert that? Well, that's, you know, what can be done in advance that helps, and I think it's the, what they call the porcupine strategy for Taiwan, and that is to make Taiwan so strong uh, and armed that it's unattractive for China to attack and, and to invade. Um, that, that's one strategy, and so that's where the weapons support for that. The mistake we made in Ukraine was we did not get them the weapons early enough to discourage an invasion. I'm gonna take a big shift here for a moment because there's a lot more going on in the U.S. House yeah. than this. Now, I would suggest there's nothing much more important than this, except there is one big item that will be coming up, and that is the debt ceiling. Um, and I, I've tried to explain in the past, this is different than the budget. The budget, the appropriations is one thing. The debt ceiling is paying for the appropriations and budget. And when the credit limit bumps up against that ceiling, the government loses its ability to pay some of its bills. And that could be everything from military to social security or, or whatever else. There has been some conversation, a lot of conversation, I think, between Republicans in the House and the administration. The administration says we want a straight, clean, nothing else but the debt ceiling bill. Republicans have said, wait a minute, we want to put some restrictions on spending in this. Where are we with that? It's going to have to come up here in the next two or three months. Yes, and I think it's important, you know, when President Biden was a United States senator, when he was vice president, he always... Uh, thought negotiations around the debt ceiling to encourage reforms to limit spending were a good idea. Now he's saying he doesn't support that. So it's, it's a bit of a change of focus. We need the president to engage with us and to negotiate because we can't keep going further and further in debt. Thirty two trillion dollars of debt is not acceptable. It's not sustainable in the long run. So uh, whereas we don't ever want to jeopardize or risk the full faith and credit of the United States, at the same time, in order to lift the debt ceiling, we should be doing things to change course 
so that we aren't going down this trajectory uh, for the foreseeable future. And so that's what we're working on in the House. Uh, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to, to uh, demonstrate to the president that he needs to come to the negotiating table. One of the things we haven't talked about is the newfound majority uh, in the House. And we watched as the process uh, to elect a speaker uh, took longer than normal. In fact, uh, former uh, Congressman Upton uh, had predicted uh, on this show that if the margin was narrow, it would take a number of votes to get a new speaker, and it did. But all of that has been resolved. Uh, the House has been constituted. You now have one leg. Uh, uh, of, of that power in Washington, D.C. What has the change done for you in the House? And are you getting the recognition from the administration or even from the Senate uh, that you are an equal player? Because, uh, uh, you know, prior to this, Democrats were in control uh, of everything. What, what is the scenario in Washington now? Well, I think we are. In fact, one example of that is the legislation when the city council in Washington, D.C. basically had a policy that they were going to no longer put in jail people who were carjackers and other violent crimes. We basically, because we have jurisdiction in Washington, D.C., uh, said, no, that's not acceptable. We need uh, you know, law and order in Washington, D.C., our nation's capital. So we came out with a bill that overturned that. Even, even, even the mayor was in favor of what we were doing. And um, President Biden initially came out and said, no, he won't support that bill, he won't get involved. Well, over time, he ended up supporting the bill and signing it into law because he realized this was the right thing to do and he wanted to be part of that. So I think my hope is that he will look at the debt ceiling, he will realize we've got to change our course on spending we ought to, you know, one of the bills that I have in the package basically says money that was set aside to be spent during a COVID emergency, if there's no longer an emergency, we shouldn't be spending those dollars wastefully. And in, in fact, it would be fraudulently to say that, you know, it was set up with this intent. Now we no longer have an uh, emergency. So that could save up to $60 billion just with money that's sitting in federal agencies right now which they will spend if we don't claw it back and say, let's use it for debt relief. One of the things that uh, the House worked on recently was a bill that would prohibit males from particip participating in female uh, athletics. Um, that bill passed doesn't stand a great chance in the Senate, I don't think, and I presume that the president wouldn't sign it. But by doing that bill, uh, tell me what the House was, was the message you're trying to say. I, I think it's to support women's sports. I mean, you look at women's sports, it's come so far. Uh, you know, it's, it's exciting to see the progress of women's sports. This has really changed the game for women's sports, and I think we ought to protect women's sports. You know, when athletes are performing at an elite level, there ought to be a fairness in terms of competition and giving biological males the ability to compete in some of these sports, it's just, it's just not a fair thing to do. And so that was our purpose in doing that. And would you concur that it has a tough road ahead of it as you move into the Senate? I do, but I think as more people realize is, you know, it's a fundamental issue of fairness. Uh, I hope that, you know, senators will hear from their constituents, especially the parents of athletes, of women athletes, who want to see an opportunity for their child to some, in some cases get college scholarships, learn the value of being part of a sports team and competing to the best of their ability against a, you know, a, a fairness in competition. Uh, this is really the first time we've had a chance to, to talk since your big new district uh, was redrawn and you were uh, reelected into it, parts of which you represented uh, before, uh, quite a bit of it you did not represent before. Uh, what are the the highlights and, and the needs that you're going to be uh, pursuing for the district as this session wears on? Well, one key area is broadband access to the internet. You know, I have a fairly rural district and that's going to be very important to continue to improve that. We saw during the pandemic, you know, whether it was telemedicine, distance learning, you know, agriculture using precision uh, 
agriculture, you know, the internet access is really important. I want to keep pushing that in the farm bill and in other ways. Uh, you know, there's a tourism aspect in, in my district now that, you know, Lake Michigan is uh, one of our great resources. I've always been a strong advocate for the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, and I'm going to continue to fight for that. Um, you know, our small businesses, our manufacturing, our agriculture, it's a great district, and, uh, and I couldn't be prouder to represent the new 2nd District. Up next, U.S. Senator Gary Peters talks about efforts to make sure next generation cars have the connectivity they need for safety and how he is supporting local fire departments in his role in Washington. That's next, To The Point. Welcome back to To The Point. U.S. Senator Gary Peters, in his role as chairman of the Homeland Security Committee, is making sure that fire departments in Michigan and around the country have the tools they need to keep communities protected. We talked about that and more this week. Senator, one of the things that uh, I found out in, in talking with some of your folks in the office is that um, while Michigan has been well represented and, and we've had seniority in the Senate, mm -hmm, right. um, certainly with Senator Levins, uh, Senator Stabenow, we haven't had a member uh, on the Appropriations Committee. And, and that is important, although a lot of the budgeting seems to be through a continuing resolution, but the Appropriations Committee is really where all the dollars and checks and all of that stuff happens. Uh, tell me about your role there and what that means for Michigan. Well, it is an incredibly important committee. Uh, as you mentioned, that's the, the regular way process as you go through uh, hearings, uh, you put together the actual spending plan, and, uh, and having someone from Michigan is important because I want to make sure that we're bringing back dollars uh, back to Michigan, that we should get our fair share of money from the federal government. But, uh, and I didn't realize the number either. Uh, when I was appointed to appropriations, I was told I'm the first senator from the state of Michigan since 1959. So. Wow quite a long time. That is a long time. And and when I mentioned continuing a resolution, sometimes regular order for budgets is hard to obtain because mm -hmm. they're, the, the budget process has become um, really the place where Republicans and Democrats seem to bang heads um, most of all. Separate, different than that, and not to be confused. There's appropriations here, but then there's something else, and that's the debt ceiling. Mm -hmm. In the past, we've seen where the government has not been able to get a budget put together and we've had partial government shutdowns which have been largely symbolic but the debt limit the debt ceiling is something much much different and over in the house they've already passed the republican controlled house with all republican votes no democrats have already passed what they would like to see done they would like have attachments to that debt ceiling that will expire sometime this summer uh, where are we in Washington on that? Because I know Democrats are opposed to that. Yeah, it, uh, I'm not sure w where we are. I mean, our position, though, is very clear that you should never, should never debate whether or not the United States government stands behind their obligations uh, and pays their debts. These, these are debts that have already been incurred. Uh, this is just about making sure that people get paid. So if you don't do that, it's a default. You, you basically default. This is like... You going out, you've already spent money, and the bill comes in the mail to you for money you've already spent, and you'll say, no, I don't, I'm not going to pay for it. I'm just going to default. That's not acceptable for individuals to do. Your credit rating is destroyed when that happens. It's certainly unacceptable for the United States government and the Treasury to do that. We know that has a major impact on the economy, uh, that uh, a default uh, would raise borrowing costs. Uh, in fact, the last time Republicans did this a few years ago came close to the default. It didn't happen, but it was estimated just by it not getting that close and putting a risk premium on interest rates cost over a billion dollars to taxpayers. This is simply unacceptable to say that uh, our government uh, and taxpayers will not pay the obligations that we've already incurred. And Again, I just want to point out there are two separate things because it is, it's not the same thing as when we've seen loggerheads with an actual budget. That's right. Because this would start to have a pretty immediate effect. Absolutely. Because, because even now the Treasury is working to move funds around to continue paying bills in advance of that limit, but if that's hit, that becomes much harder to do. It does, absolutely. It is completely, uh, completely different. You'll see the, if the credit rating is impacted, interest rates go up. You'll see the stock market uh, down dramatically as it did. We, we've already seen it play out 
about a decade ago. That means people's retirement savings will be hit. This, this, is, uh, this is a very dangerous game that the Republicans are playing. It shouldn't be played at all. Uh, we passed these when, when President Trump was uh, president. These were passed uh, uh, without any objection because, folks, we realized that you can't basically hold the country hostage uh, with something as damaging to the economy as defaulting on debt. Let's shift gears in a big way because you and I have a lot of ground to cover and not a lot of time to do it. So I want to talk about something that you have been urging the FCC to do, and that is to get connectivity for our new generation automobiles. And I, I saw some of this technology down at M-City when I visited mm -hmm. down there with Governor Snyder years ago. Uh, and it was amazing then. I'm sure it's grown by quantum leaps. But what is the FCC's role in that, and what have you been asking them to do? Well, FCC, we've asked them to put waivers to allow more of this technology to get into automobiles and infrastructure. So basically what you're referring to is our cars talk to each other. Uh, and talk to the road. So with the proper sensors, you put sensors in the road, for example, on a bridge, and says, this is icing up. That would communicate with your car and saying, there's ice on this bridge, slow down, make sure that you can navigate that safely. Or car to car, uh, there's a car uh, in front of me that's putting its brakes on, your car will know that car in front of you is putting its brakes on, and it will put the brakes on faster than we could do it as humans. It's a major safety innovation. We lose over 40 thousand people on our highways every year significant numbers of people will be saved with this technology i'm encouraged uh, that it's moving forward finally with waivers that we can get more cars equipped with this technology more than one member <clears throat> one former member of the house and other members <clears throat> have said paraphrasing that when this kind of technology is fully utilized fully embraced and implemented that we will look back on these years where we're losing 40 some years it's been 50,000 people in auto accidents and and think about how really unnecessary I mean it, the technology hasn't been available right. for a long time but this will change dramatically the way things happen on the roads uh, there's no no question about it yeah I think you're right people look back and think how did folks uh, uh, how could they deal with such carnage, basically, on our highways? Not just the 40,000 plus deaths, but you think about all of the significant injuries that are occurring, debilitating injuries. Technology can prevent the, a good share of those from happening. Usually human error is involved. If you can try to minimize the human error, uh, you'll save lives. Let's talk about another form of transportation, and that's by air. You were recently at the Gerald R. Ford International Airport, big expansion coming out there. And overall, the uh, airline industry is facing some challenges out there, but uh, at least at Ford, one of them is not going to be the infrastructure at the airport. That's right, yeah. It was exciting to, to, to be out there. Uh, we were able to procure federal money to help uh, the project there that uh, the community has come together and bonded for some major improvements. It's uh, going to be beautiful when it opens up from what I saw so far. But we added gates to uh, accommodate the additional traffic that's coming into the Gerald Ford Airport and as well as future expansion. Uh, over $8 million from the infrastructure package. Uh, money that I worked uh, on a congressionally directed spending of $1.3 million will also help uh, make improvements uh, on that concourse to allow that airport to continue to grow. It's one of the one of the nicest airports. I fly to a lot of airports around the country. It's one of the nicest airports I ever go to, and it's going to get even better. And I was uh, proud to announce federal money that I was able to uh, procure to help uh, that along. Well, it's going through big changes. I think this is the 60th anniversary for that airport out there, and it certainly doesn't look like what it did when, when it opened, that's for sure. Uh, I want to talk about something else that also goes to safety and something that people don't think about very much much, but that is that the federal government, in your role as the chairman of the Homeland Security um, Committee, helps local fire departments from everything from training to manpower to equipment. And when you say, well, why is that a big deal? Well, it's a big deal because their equipment and their training is vital to protecting local poli uh, people and interest mm -hmm. here. So tell me about this package that's been reauthorized, once again makes federal money available to local fire departments. It, it, it does. It makes uh, grants available, competitive grants. The fire departments apply for safer grants for uh, firefighters as well as equipment grant grants. And you mentioned how expensive it is. The reason the federal government is helpful is that this equipment is incredibly expensive difficult for local communities, especially if you're a smaller community. It's very difficult to have the kind of equipment necessary. So for an example, as I've traveled around the state, one very popular piece of equipment purchased with these grants is the jaws of life that you know, opens up a car. If you're in a car crash and you're trapped, you need to get out. That equipment's $60,000, 70000 
If you're a larger department, you can probably afford it, but if you're a small department, you can't, and yet you have car crashes in your community. Someone is in a crash, they're trapped. People would expect their first responders to have the equipment necessary to save their lives. That's what this is about. I'm happy it passed. It's, uh, I uh, authored uh, legislation. We passed it through the Senate uh, last week. It's off to the House, and hopefully we'll pass there in a bipartisan way, and the President will sign it soon. And these are similar to grants that have been offered before, so many fire departments probably already know how to access, access them. They do. In fact, uh, I did an event uh, here with the Grand Rapids uh, Fire Department. Uh, they showed uh, a number of pieces of equipment that they were able to purchase, uh, respirators, for example, for their firefighters to go into a burning building filled with smoke and to be able to do that safely and to be able to do their job. Talk about another subject that you and I have talked about a lot. I think this is going to come down largely to supply chain, but it's shortages of drugs. For example, I know there are respiratory um, infections that are going around. We did the story last week, um, and it's tough for doctors and hospitals because amoxicillin is in mm -hmm. short supply. That's one of dozens and dozens uh, of, of drugs, medications that are in short supply, and that's still a lingering, at least partially lingering, uh, result of the supply chain problem. It is, and, and, uh, and this supply chain issue has predated the pandemic. It's gotten worse than the pandemic. I did a report through my committee that I chair looking at drug shortages, the fact that every week hospitals have to make decisions because they can't find a drug, to, and uh, usually the replacement is uh, a more expensive drug that's less effective because of shortages. Uh, the report that I put out in 2019 uh, actually concluded when there's a pandemic, this is going to get worse. It did. We just put out a new report, and it's gotten a lot worse. We, and we have to bring on shore the drugs, basically. Most of the precursors of every drug we use is made in India or primarily China. Uh, we don't have a secure supply chain, and when you don't have a secure supply chain, you get shortages. So we need to work to onshore these critical supplies. To me, it's a national security, homeland security issue. Uh, we're working on legislation to incentivize that, but also to find out where those gaps are so that we can plug those gaps. When you talk about onshoring, bringing things back, you've been talking about this for a good long while now, starting, not starting with, but certainly highlighted with the CHIPS Act mm -hmm. and trying to get those chips that have slowed down auto production, production of washers and dryers, everything else everything. that uses uh, a chip. And so that's kind of at the beginning stages to start get, getting those factories up and running. Do we need to be doing the same thing with our, uh, with our medicines and uh, with our pharmaceuticals? Do we need to encourage and incentivize getting those back on shore because it is, as you put it, a national security risk? Uh, absolutely. We have to be looking at those, uh, all of those industries. We do that now with the Department of Defense. We make sure our weapon systems are, are manufactured here in the United States. We have secure supply chain because of national defense. That's clear. But clear, but I would say it's also clear if you don't have drugs to help people get through illnesses, uh, that's a national security issue. We saw it with chips in the auto uh, industry. We're overly dependent on Taiwan, South Korea, and others for these uh, chips. We need to bring it on shore and made by American workers, American companies. But I think we have to expand the list of what are critical supplies and, and critical supply chains, and that's what we're in the process of doing right now. Just got a little time left, and I want to talk about something uh, that I find pretty interesting. Uh, last year in the Senate, you introduced and passed 19 bills? That's correct. That's a lot. That doesn't happen very often. And given that you now have divided government, I wouldn't expect that to be a repeat. How do you how do, you do that in a, a town that, and I don't want to mischaracterize it, I know that there is still some cooperation, but in a town that increasingly makes everything a Republican or a Democratic issue? Well, uh, it's because I work on a bipartisan basis. So if you look at the, the bills, uh, you mentioned uh, last Congress, I had more bills that I authored, uh, signed into law than any senator, a Democratic or a Republican, most in 40 years. And the Congress before, even when I was in the minority, I was a minority member of the Senate, I had more bills signed even than Republican majority members signed into law. But if you look at all those bills, they're all bipartisan. I always seek out a Republican co-sponsor, one or more. We come together around a, a, a common goal and, uh, and to solve a particular problem, and we work through that and use the relationships that I've built with my colleagues. Kind of old school, uh, build relationships with your colleagues, so work collaboratively. They're, we're not going to agree on everything. You're going to see some, uh, some very contentious debates, but there's a whole lot more that we can agree on. I bring folks together and we get bills passed. Senator, we have much more to talk about. I hope you'll come back when we can do it. 
I look forward to it. Thank you. I'll be back with a final thought in just a moment. To the point. It's about 18 months before the next presidential election, and the race for the White House is starting to take shape with President Biden's announcement that he will seek re-election after former President Trump announced that he too will try again to become president earlier. It could set up a rematch between the two, but there are other candidates, both announced and pondering, that may try to change that in the coming months. It's something we'll be watching when you join us every week right here, To The Point.